so appreciate the privilege of being able to come on Sunday and be with you. I want to thank Brother Dave for taking a vacation <laughs> so that I can do that. But, you know, uh, I've, I've been there. I've, I've been on that vacation where you were coming back on Friday or Saturday and, and uh, had to be prepared uh, for Sunday morning. So it is, it's great to have a break. Also, <laughs> thank you for singing that song. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, have you heard that song before? So, yeah, some of you have, I know, because uh, it's an old song. Um, is that the right way to say that? Um, <laughs> that song was actually written in the late 40s uh, by a gentleman who became a very famous songwriter. I, I had never heard of him. This song appeared in the 1951 All-American Church Hymnal which all good American churches had, apparently, in 1951. In 1949, that song sold two million copies. In 1949. You couldn't stream it. You, you probably couldn't buy it very easily, even on a pressed platter. But it still sold two million copies because it just really, it speaks to our hearts, doesn't it? I tell you, you know you have an old guy preaching when he requests a song that's so old nobody can remember it and it's about heaven. That's, that's, I'm giving myself away. But the reason that I, that I requested that song is because uh, I sang it the other day with my family. Uh, we had gathered together for the homegoing of one of my aunts. Now, uh, I come from a, a really big family. Uh, my grandmother had uh, about a dozen children. I say about a dozen. Not all of them made it to uh, adulthood. It was back in the 20s and 30s. But we have a really, really big family. And, and so when we gather together, and, and we don't do that very often anymore, and it's usually for a funeral, uh, but when we gather together, there's a lot of people there. And so I have an aunt my Aunt Sue, uh, she passed away uh, a few days ago. Uh, she was in her 80s. Aunt Sue was a missionary for 50 years in the Philippine Islands. She is an amazing lady. And uh, she had recently uh, returned from the Philippines because of her health. She, they, they really didn't want to come back. But, you know, when you're 80-something and you have a stroke, you don't have many choices. So with great reluctance, they returned to the United States and uh, she, she passed away recently. So my family gathered for the funeral and this was one of her favorite songs. And so the, it was just, uh, it was a great event. I mean, I, I know that it's weird to say that about a, a funeral, but I mean, really it was a church service, right? I mean, here she was, a woman who knew the Lord. Her eternity was going to be fantastic. She had gone to her reward. We were sad for her departure, but so happy for her. And, and so really, everybody was uh, quite upbeat. Now, in my family, we have some preachers, we have some missionaries, and so whenever we have a funeral or something like that, it's always going to be interesting to see who gets tapped to preach the funeral message. Uh, and so in this case, it was my cousin Gary, and uh, we tease Gary a lot. He's, he's my age. And uh, so this was going to be great. I was going to sit and uh, critique, I mean, uh, take notes on his sermon uh, so that I could give him some encouraging feedback. And, <laughs> and so we did. And uh, man, Gary did a great job. It, it was really fantastic. He talked about his mom and, and all that. And at the end, they have this video. Now, you know, funeral videos, they're all montages not this one. This was a very specific one. This was a video of her singing this song. And she started to sing the song on the video. And the whole room sang that song at full voice. I mean, oh, by the way, we had the All-American Church hymnal there with shape notes and we're all church going people in my family 
So they all know how to read music. And let me tell you, it was like being with the Baptist Tabernacle Choir. It was so good. It was so good. And you know what? It was just as good this morning. That was great. (laughs) David, thank you for doing that. That was awesome. But it was my family. I mean, you know, family. Okay, here we go. All of my cousins, all of my aunts and uncles, they're all weird, just like yours, okay? And, and, when they, and we talk about each other all the time. Oh, my gosh, Gary, he's put on some weight, hasn't he? You know, or whatever it is. They say the same thing about me. Uh, but we can be very together, you know? I mean, you know how it is. I, You can pick on me, but don't pick on my brother. Or, you know, hey, listen, we may fight like cats and dogs, but if you pick on them, I'm going to hurt you. You know, that kind of thing. That's kind of how we are. I mean, listen, we don't even all go to the same kind of church or anything. Uh, We, (laughs) but we're together. Now, I have a couple of aunts that are strongly opinionated women. I don't really like to do things the way that they do them. But if they say, this is how we're going to do it, guess what? That's how we're going to do it. All right? Because they're my aunties and I want to do the right thing. I have aunties. I even, listen, I have so many aunties. I have an auntie named Auntie. Okay? And that is the truth. So I was reminded of the power of a family recently when we all gathered together in all of our weirdness. Oh my gosh. We sat in that church and we all came in and I thought, well, I didn't really think this, but this is the way I'm going to say it. We are such a diverse group. (laughs) We're very diverse. This morning, I want to talk about family. If you would turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And we will read this together here in just a moment. But one of the reasons why this is at the top of my mind is because I got to spend time with my family here recently, but I've also been spending time with my church family recently. So I finished this lengthy interim. I've been doing some preaching interims out of town and I've I've finished them. And so the last several weeks, I have had what is for me the great and unique privilege of attending church at my home. So even though I don't really maybe know all of you, uh, I'm like that family member that you don't know very well. Hey, (laughs) we're family members. (laughs) Can I come over? (laughs) I have enjoyed being here. I have really enjoyed watching our church family come together Uh, in the recent task force force effort, because that was great. That, I I tell you, I could not be more proud of my pastor and my home church to watch uh, us go through that process together and then to come out on the other side with this report, which to me looks like a significant opportunity to get involved. You know what I mean? I mean, somebody said, well, that report, all it does is just form some committees. Well, well, we're Baptists. That's the way we do it. Uh, but, but actually, it's more than that. What it is, is it's a structure for us to become connected to, the, to what's going on. You know, I mean, here we've provided an opportunity, and now I will have a chance even to, to serve in some area because they have so many there. And I have really enjoyed watching our church family do this together. It's, it's, it's awesome. But I do have some questions because even though these are such exciting days, I have a question. How are we going to do this? I mean, I can see what it is we want to do and I can see what we're planning to do. I just really don't know how it's all going to happen. I mean, it's almost as if somebody, there ought to be somebody who knows all this stuff, right? There's somebody. I don't, I don't know. We, actually, probably our pastor knows all of this. And so, perhaps, Brother Dave, do you have all this? 
well, okay, so we should organize for this, right? Organize for the mission. In fact, we, we often define the church as uh, the body of Christ organized for the mission that God has given us. So we should organize for the mission. But I think the question is, how will we do that? Now, um, I, I have lots of uh, um, possibilities. I mean, I've been around for a little while. We could, we could organize ourselves like, uh, maybe we could organize ourselves like a business and we could attack the problem. All right. Let's build a budget. Let's attack the problem. We'll only do as much as we can afford to do. Uh, we'll probably get some like consultants and professionals and there should be lots of electronics involved. I think that's the way the business, if we were taking a business strategy, that's the way we would do it. But that really doesn't seem very church-like. So maybe we should, maybe we should organize ourselves like an army. I mean, you know, God has an army, right? I think they're all angels, but, but we could organize ourselves that way and we could have like generals and we could have commanders and we could have privates and I would be a private. But honestly, I don't think that's really what God has called us to do either. Um, in fact, uh, I've heard a lot of preachers talk about how we ought to be a team. You know, maybe we should operate as a team and we could have a, uh, like a football team, we could have quarterbacks and, and uh, linemen and, and, and wide receivers. Or we've been watching the Olympics. Maybe there's some kind of team there that would work for us. You know, the fact is, as a church, Paul, in his letter to Timothy, told us that we should actually conduct ourselves in a very specific way. And it's not like a business or an army or a team. In fact, it's none of those things. The mission and the ministry of God is to be advanced using the most challenging and difficult institution imaginable on the face of this earth, the family. That's right. God has called you to reach the world with your mother-in-law and your cousins and your brother that you don't like and your sister-in-law that none of the ladies get along with. That's a nervous chuckle if I ever heard one. <laughs> really? A family? You have got to be kidding me. I mean, this is a structure that changes regard, uh, depending on which family you're in, right? I mean, it, it's literally without consistency because whatever family you go to, they're going to do it different. They're probably going to do it wrong, but they'll do it, you know. Everybody, how could family be the way? Well, Paul, in his uh, letter to Timothy, uh, here in 1 Timothy, he talks about the church. And he talks about leadership within the church. And we look at this passage, chapter 3 of Timothy, many times as the, the guidance for uh, our deacons and our pastors and our leaders in the church. And so we read this passage with that in mind. Paul was concerned when he was writing to Timothy that he would not be able to bring to him at Ephesus the kind of guidance that they needed. He was coming to help give them some guidance on how to accomplish the mission, how to organize with leaders, how to do the things that needed to be done. And he was concerned that if he weren't able to get there to tell them, how would they know? And so he writes this letter. And uh, here in chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, he is transitioning from the what ought to be to the here's how to do it. And so we kind of glide past these passages sometimes without realizing that they contain some pretty important guidance. Let's stand together and read this passage. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Paul is speaking to Timothy and he says, I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, 
the pillar and support of the truth. You may be seated. This is a preacher's dream. It has three points separated by commas. It could not go better. I write to you so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the house of God. Point number one. Point number two, which is the church of the living God. Point number three, the pillar and support of the truth. So this is a piece of cake. If you're an outliner, get ready to write. If you're a highlighter, get ready to highlight. Please circle the words ought and to conduct. Ought. Hey, we ought to do this, right? Yeah, but we never do. (laughs) <laughs> you see, that's, that's because that's what ought means to us. But that's not what Paul means. When Paul says ought, he didn't actually write the word ought. <laughs> he write the word, wrote the word must. Must. It's an imperative. It's what we must do. It's what we should, not just should do, but we should, in fact, strive to accomplish. It's not a request. So here's how you must conduct oneself. And and so I'm going to give you these two definitions because they make a difference for the rest of the time we're together. Must conduct. Conduct, another great word, and it actually has its roots in the word conversation. Here's how we are to have conversation. And it's really not even just conversation. It's actually all manners of relating. Here's how we ought to relate to one another. Paul is saying, here's how you must relate to one another. This is the basis for your relationship. All of the things that you say and do, this will govern them. When you're getting ready to decide where to go, what to do, how to do it, look at this. This should govern that decision. This is how we must relate to one another. This is what he says. And he says that we should do it as the household of God. (coughs) excuse me the meaning of household has not changed in 2000 years there's nothing mysterious about it it doesn't mean anything different in greek than it does in english household means household so we shouldn't have any difficulty understanding that but why would he say household why didn't he just say hey conduct yourselves as the church But it, it, the church, as a body of believers, existed. But the church, as a building to come to, did not. And so, and so, it they they would never have thought, "Hey, go to the church." What is that? We're the church, right? What do you mean, go to the church? I mean, there's a temple, <laughs> right? But what do you mean the church? That would be the reaction of a first century Christian. And so so God does not speak to us that way. God speaks to us in the same way that he has always spoken to us. As a family. He is our father. Christ is the bridegroom, right? These are all family terms. And so... And so what I think that we do is we, we like to think of the idea of like the nuclear family or, or you know, the perfect family as, as the objective and kind of like the ideal circumstance. And we never deal with the reality of the family. I mean, you know, right? I, I haven't been in your family, but I'm assuming that yours is not perfect. If it is, with all due respect, you need to go. Because we're not and we'll mess you up. Actually, I meant to say we're not perfect and we don't want to mess we, we don't want you to mess us up. This is a place for imperfect families, but we never deal with that. We never deal with that. We never say, well, if if families aren't perfect, then that means that we're not in here perfect, right? As a church family. And that means that we have like aunties and uncles that we probably wouldn't do it that way. But because there are aunties and uncles, we say, yes, ma'am. 
And, and yes, sir, right? And we think that some of us are kind of weird, but we don't say that out loud. <laughs> we say it behind their backs the way we're supposed to. <laughs> but see, we are a family. Christians did not have houses of worship in the first century. And so their only model for how church is, is the household, the household of God. And by the way, it's not that far removed from our own experience. I mean, uh, Fran, one of Fran's greatest memories when she was growing up was her grandmother lived with them. And so the idea of multi-generational families being in the same household and the dynamics that go along with that is nothing new. We know how it is. Listen, we respect and care for our elders. And we help with the children, <laughs> all right? And when we need help with one another, we do that. And we don't do it because we agree with what they're doing or we condone their behavior. We do it because they're family. It's important. We're not, family is not without challenges. We have lots of things that rub us the wrong way in relationships. But you know, it's not just like living with somebody. It's not like we have roommates. Listen, if you have a roommate and you don't like them, you can get rid of them or you can leave. But you don't get to do that with family. Many have tried. <laughs> Trust me, you can run, but you can't hide. We'll find you. So, so we should not regard one another in church like roommates either, right? I mean, we should treat one another like family, not like somebody who may be here today or gone tomorrow. In the family of God, we actually should be expert at living with the tension of family and the grace of God. It's, it's the way it is. And, and, and doing that grows us up, makes us mature, learning to um, speak the truth in love and to know how to relate with one another. And so just, because, just, just so that we don't get off track, let's remember what we're talking about. We're talking about the fact that Paul said to Timothy, listen, when you go, when you have church together, there's a way that you should conduct yourselves. And conducting yourselves is... is you should conduct yourselves like a family, like the household of God. Now, you may say, well, maybe I want to, maybe I don't. Uh, they may not be doing things that I like. Let me tell you something. Man does not protect the church. God protects the church. I have been in many where things were not going right and people were doing distasteful things. Let me just say, God doesn't need us to enforce his will on others. He's perfectly capable of doing that himself. Really, the greater challenge is getting along and learning how to do that. And we should get really good at it because the world does not know how to do it, but we do. And there's a reason why we do, and Paul says it in the next phrase. He says, because we are the church of the living God. Why is that a big deal? Because we're not the church of God, we're the church of the living God. Why is that important? Because he's here. We behave a certain way because our God is here. Listen, if our God was dead or gone or somewhere, we would do whatever we wanted to do. We'd tear the place down because we would, who cares? And that's exactly the situation in the first century. There in Ephesus, Temple of Diana. What, surely you've heard this before. One of, the, one of the wonders of the world, it was so massive. But of course, their God was dead, Right? So that meant they could do whatever they wanted. And so that's why they had temple prostitutes and they did all of these things that were so distasteful because they had their own agenda. They, they did what they wanted to do because God wasn't there. So who cares? Our God is here. And we conduct ourselves in a way that acknowledges that. And we relate with one another in a way that acknowledges that. That we have a living, a living God. We don't satisfy ourselves, we satisfy our God. If your God is dead, then your conduct should satisfy you. But if your God is alive, your conduct should satisfy God. Amen? Yeah, see, that's not that hard. 
That's why I'm always cautious when church members say, they complain about things that go on in church. Oh, Brother Dave, this is great. I get to say things that you could never say. I won't be specific. I won't call names. I don't know any names. I couldn't call them. Um, you know, that's why I'm always cautious when church members uh, start to complain about um, things that go on in church because they give themselves away. When people complain about how things are going in church, they totally give themselves away. Well, I really don't like, uh, I'm, you know, I have, I'm not happy with, or, you know, so-and-so said they aren't, and I am not either. And <laughs> they give themselves away. What's the theme of their conversation? I. <laughs> Does, I I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm under, I think some people are under the misunderstanding that church is for them. <laughs> well, but as a family, instead, what we say is, you know, I may not understand why they're doing that, but, you know, that's my auntie. And so, or that's my uncle. And so I think probably the best thing to do would be just to go say, hey, uncle. How, how, why do you do that like that? And he'll tell me, and then I'll be okay. Because if I don't like it, I'm going to go along because I respect him. And if I do like it, I'm going to say, how can I help you? <laughs> I want to do it too. That's what a family member does. Our conduct is different. It's selfless. It's not selfish because our God is not dead. And we're not satisfying ourselves. Our God is living. And by our good works, we will glorify our Father who is in heaven. So finally, it's necessary that we conduct ourselves in a particular way because we have a living God. And Paul says, and God says, that, that we are, the church is the pillar and the buttress of the truth. Now, I know your Bible may say support, but the word is buttress. And I know it's buttress because it's harder to understand. Now, uh, what he is saying here is he is depicting the church. This is, this is fun. He is depicting the church as holding up the truth. Some translations have gone, had, are not comfortable with that. They do not like the idea of holding up the truth. And so they rewrite that passage of scripture to say that, we, that the church is the foundation of the truth. Okay, well, that is true. I mean, the truth is, I mean, not the church is the foundation of the truth, but the truth is the foundation of the church. That is true. But it is also true that our role is to uphold the truth, right? And so when it says that, that we are a pillar and a buttress of the truth, it's just simply saying that we understand what our mission is. We understand what it is we're supposed to accomplish. Our role here is to lift up the truth. Make it visible, make it hearable and seeable so that others uh, can hear the truth as well. But he's used this kind of uh, architectural example. But that's not unusual. In Revelation 3.12, uh, the Lord told us that uh, the victor, he would make him a pillar in the sanctuary of my God. Holding up. We don't, we don't really get all of that architectural stuff, but let me tell you something. The people of the first century did because the Temple of Diana had 127 gold-covered covered pillars. Most of them had the names of people on them. People who had donated money, you know, community leaders, selfless, self, selfless, not selfless, selfish acts. The church of God is not made by human hands. It is composed of those who belong to the church. And because of that, we ought to conduct ourselves a particular way. That family, the family model is so difficult, but it is superior. It's superior to a business strategy because people are more important than things. There is no target that we could go after as a business that would be more important than the lives of men. 
And we don't organize ourselves like a military or like the army because our objective is not to destroy or conquer. Our objective is to persuade and to win. And there is, you know, our objective is not to make people lose so that we can win. We're not organized as a team because winning is not enough. We want to see lives changed. And so we care both about the mission and the people. They are inseparable. So because of that, this mission is best accomplished by a family that the world cannot tear apart because there is no power greater than a family united. And it's better than any other model because we're not worried about winning. We've already won, all right? We know where the victory lies. Let's get as many there as we can as a family. Jesus has given his own blood for us to be family members. We're co-heirs with Christ. We're in the family. Jesus is my brother. Our goal is to grow the family. So this morning, I want to invite you to be part of the family. Jesus is inviting you to be part of the family. And it doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done or who you think you are. Let me tell you, you're not too weird for us. <laughs> How's that for an evangelistic strategy? <laughs> you're also not too bad for God because his arm is not too short. He can forgive. If you think you got more than anybody else, come on. Jesus is inviting you. We're inviting you. We want you to be here. If you're here today and you do not have a church home, just to make sure you hear this this morning, we want you to be here. We want you to be part of our family. It is more fun with you. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, could I just tell you, you need a family. You have an earthly family. Now, let's get the forever family, all right? We want you to be part of our family. More importantly, Jesus has extended the invitation and he has made it possible for you to come. So if today you would like to be part of the family, here's what you will enjoy. You will enjoy being part of the greatest mission effort on this earth, the single greatest. You will be part of a family that you can never not be a part of again. You can enjoy the peace of forgiveness. You can come in here. And it's not like other families where you have all your stuff inside and you go to be with the family and they just don't even know what your life is like. Let me just tell you, we know. We know, and we still want you. Jesus wants you.